Deception is a terrible thing. It can come internally, it can come externally. It comes through the mass media, it comes through the mouth of people, and sometimes even within the mind of the individual, there can be forms of deception. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah to Yunus, in the 16th verse, Allah tells us, and who is more unjust than he who forges a lie against Allah or denies his signs? Surely the criminals, the wrongdoers, will never be successful. This is a very strong verse. And this word mujrim, talking about ijram, is a very strong description of, 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 of deceiving people, of, of presenting the wrong image. And what we have noticed is that when the word Islam comes to the surface, when people are, are from the mainstream hear the word Islam or Muslims, an image of negativity comes to their minds and their hearts. And we did a study in Toronto. We went to the different corporations. It was an anti-racist study. And this is where we were testing the, the psychology of people in relationship to different ethnic groups. And so we, there was a person who was a native, um, and there was a working woman, and there was a person of African descent. And I was the Muslim in this psychological test. And so they asked the people, look at the picture. And for instance, the picture we would show them ice, and they answer cold. They see sugar, and they answer sweet. And then they saw Muslim, or Islam. And every single person in the corporation answered violence. Some of them said, holy violence. They said, holy violence. And so when I began to explain to them that the word Islam, the very word itself, comes from peace, and it really means uh, submit, uh, finding peace in submission to the Creator and, and beginning to explain what Islam is, the people were in confusion because what was presented to them, what they took in to be reality, was something different than what we know about Islam in the Muslim world. This is a case of deception. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, our Prophet wasallam predicted in many, many traditions the fact that as we come closer to the Day of Judgment, more and more problems and calamities and trials and afflictions are going to come upon us. In one beautiful hadith in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet ﷺ said that each and every Prophet warned his Ummah about the problems that they would face. And what I am telling you is that this Ummah of mine its blessed era is the earlier era. And as for the later eras, that's basically us. As for the later times, The later times are going to be afflicted with trials and calamities that you will find difficult to bear. And our Prophet ﷺ said in this hadith, Every time one trial comes, it will make the one before it look trivial. Each one will make the one before it seem to be trivial. And brothers and sisters, wallahi, when you look at the events and occurrences in the last decade and a half, it appears that, wallahu musta'an, we are seeing this hadith enacted before our very eyes. Every time we thought that nothing worse can happen, another calamity, another tragedy, the rise of Islamophobia. It is truly unbelievable that the primary Republican candidate can so casually suggest that all Muslims should be ID'd, that all Muslims should now have a special registration. It is unbelievable that one of the most prominent candidates to become president can say that we should shut down every single mosque in America. Brothers and sisters, I cannot stress enough how dangerous such rhetoric is. Why? Because no law can be passed without the population somehow wanting that law to be passed. And in order for the population to want that law to be passed, it must begin 
by stigmatization to simply suggest something that might be preposterous and then it is considered to be too preposterous for now then it will be brought up again then once again and then the next thing you know that law will become a reality and if we each and every one of us the Muslim American community and our allies who want to help us in our protection of our First Amendment values if we do not start acting now if we take a lazy attitude if we consider this to be mere talk then I worry about the next few years the presidential candidate explicitly said we all know that mosques are centers of radicalization what a blatant lie wallahi this is such a bold-faced lie we all know the people who frequent the mosques we all know that mosques are not at all the hotbeds of radicalization we all know that mosques are places of worship of community of children playing of iftar parties this is what the masjid is for and yet the presumption the perception the notion that mosques are hotbed of radicalization the question dear brothers and sisters if we are not going to correct this misunderstanding then who will if we're still going to be lazy if we're gonna pass the buck somebody else is gonna do it brothers and sisters we have to realize and I don't want to sound alarmist here but already parallels are being drawn between rhetoric from the far right now and rhetoric from the Nazi party of the 1920s Germany already parallels are being drawn one of the main publications of England compared Muslims to rats invading into its territory. This is exactly what the Nazis did to describe the Jews of their own lands. The notion of monitoring a specific ethnicity or race was something the Nazis did to every Jew. You had to register, you had to wear an identity badge. And for 70, 80 years, the motto, the slogan was never again, never again, never again. Guess what? We are now hearing the same rhetoric every Muslim should be monitored. The Republican candidate said, we will ask every Muslim to register their identity. Brothers and sisters, again, I don't want to sound alarmist here, but if we're not going to take action now, who else is going to take action? If we're not going to do something to help each other out now and get the help of the broader community, then what is going to happen in the future?